Welcome to the Sam Dean Podcast, where we talk about life uncensored. Our show is brought to you by Van Tant Coffee, the best tasting locally roasted coffee you can drink. Order yours online at VanZantCoffee.com or show up to any CrossFit Van Zant location, Canton or Athens, and buy yourself a bag. Thank you guys for the support. Our podcast has grown. I've got over 4,000 listeners. If you want to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to me at vzfit at me.com or send me a message on social media. Today on the show, I'm very excited to have Wesley Pruitt Jr. Wesley is an incredible musician, local guy. You can find him playing live tonight at Moore's Store in Ben Wheeler, Texas, or tomorrow at Wind Down. He's just a solid guy. Uh, we went to high school together. I hope you enjoy the show. Thanks for listening. See you later. All right. Here we are. Wesley, thanks for being here today. And I'm glad to be here. I called you about two hours ago and said, hey, can you do a podcast today? And you said, well, let me see. Yes, I can do it. Yeah, it worked out. It worked <laughs> out, man. I don't. I, it, it, it was meant to be here. That's how yeah. everything's been. And you got a haircut appointment. You're about to go. You have a show tonight at Moore's store. Yes, sir. Acoustic duo tonight. Who's and, your uh, Who's your drummer? Uh, it's Mikey Smiley Mills. <laughs> Mikey Smiley. Yes, sir. Mills. Everybody knows him from his smile. He's always just smiling on stage. He was my keyboard player first, uh, but he's a drummer now. He's a better drummer. He has a keyboard player. Interesting. Yeah. So Wesley Pruitt Jr. The Wesley Pruitt Band. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're called? Yes, sir. So Wesley is a professional musician. So f since high school, and we'll talk about this. Uh, but he's been playing shows. Uh, he's been he's played more shows, and this is just what I know. And me and you haven't spoken much today. You've played more shows for money than anybody that I've ever met, um, or anybody that I actually personally know. And you've you've really done it. Of course, you do other side jobs and stuff to make ends meet, probably. Since COVID, yes. Since COVID, yes. Uh, and we'll get into all of that, uh, but. How often? How many times a week do you perform? On a normal, you know, on a normal standpoint, we aim for two to three shows a week. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, if we if we're out, it's longer than that. Uh, but you know, now it's all about balance for me. So mm -hmm. ten to twelve shows a month is what we look at. Ten to twelve shows a month, and you're you're mainly Van Zant County um, around here. Where do you primarily perform at? In Van Zant County, uh, we call Moore Store our home our home show. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as local there, I mean we're at Wine Down Saturday. Yeah, you know, but, you know we play all over. So, so so Ben Wheeler, Texas, Moore Store tonight. Acoustic, yes, sir. Acoustic, and then where are you at this weekend? We'll be there well, tonight, and then we'll be at Wine Down uh, tomorrow night. Saturday, Wine Down, yeah. Canton, Texas. That's awesome. Um, so you. I mean, you, you're a you're a real musician. Like I, I'm a musician. Like I play a wedding from time to time. I play, I will play wind down once a year maybe, uh, and I'm a cover. I play cover songs. You know, I don't play hardly any anything that I've written, which, um, it's all terrible anyway. But, um, you have albums. How many? Tell me about the albums. So with this, we we have a we're releasing an album in three weeks. Mm -hmm. Maybe three and a half weeks, and that's gonna make our uh, second full album. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've had two EPs before that, so that'll be a total of four albums. Um, but yeah, that's it's 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 titled Gypsy Soul. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be twelve tracks, and it's an eight year story of my personal life and everything everything off of this is it's what's happened the last eight years. That's what's gonna be on that album. And the singles, Cocaine and Whiskey, is that right? That that was from the last album. I wanted that's to I wanted to do a video just okay. to kind of get buzz rolling. All right, so know? that's from the last album. Yeah, this, this Gypsy Soul is the new one. Yes. Okay. Yes. And that three week about three weeks. About three weeks. It's Are there. you on iTunes uh, or Apple Music? Uh, uh, the Line 'Em Up album is with, line the, one, em the up. one with Cocaine and Whiskey, and we had okay. a radio hit with Poor Man Blues. Uh, but this will be on on every everything you can get music. The Gypsy okay. Soul will be available. The best way for you to make money is playing shows. Is that right? Uh, that's my career. Yeah. You know, the money is not always great, but that is what I love to do. 
And as far as being a musician, these yeah. days you have to play shows to make money. You can't survive off singles on I th Apple Music. No. Nobody's bu you can't survive off CD sales anymore. No. And you can't, you don't get enough royalties if you're, unless you're Garth Brooks or something. Um, but you have to make money from playing shows. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that is that is what you, that, that's that's the survival thing is it's playing. And you work your ass off. You You unload the equipment. You set up. You're nice to everybody. You play, you know, you try to keep everybody entertained. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the night, you pack everything up, you load it out, you go back, you probably unload it. You don't get home till late. I mean, that's it's hard. It is. It's it's, and I know just from my small experience, it is a lot of work. And to have live music, that you know, it, it's a it's a joy to have to be in a place where a musician is playing, but just know that it is so much damn work to even bring that show there. And man, it. <laughs> so you know, I mean, yeah, I'm not you're preaching. I'm preaching to the choir with you, but. So let me just say I respect the hell out of you for just for being the guy that's, that's and I've told you that before, that, yeah. has, that has done it and it's kept doing it because, you know, I always think about, well, what's your dream job? Like that is a dream of mine to be a performer like all the time. And, um, you know, it's not gla it's not glamorous on your level at sometimes and it's not glamorous at the top level. I mean, it's it's all, you know, you're a, you're a. In some ways, let me, you know, I know I've got you on my podcast, but <laughs> I feel like I'm talking. <laughs> when I was a kid, when I started playing guitar, my mom would say, hey, Sam, play the guitar. You know, she'd have people over. Play the, play us the song. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to get, you know, and you knew me when I was younger or, and you were young. But I start playing the guitar and I'm terrified. I'm, I'm not terrified to play, but then I'm terrified to sing because I'm a young man and you know, I don't want to somebody to tell me I'm, you know, I sound like shit or anything. So I'm terrified and I'm, I'm getting up the courage to play in front of these people and I'm, and I'm performing and then everybody just starts talking and it just, it infuriates me, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one of the things you have to get over is, is, uh, you know, when you're a performer, you're like a jester. You're like a, the people, you know, at a bar, the main, the business is the people there. That's where they make money. You're the entertainment. How do you get over that? How do you, how do you just, you know, when people are talking, you, let's say you go to, uh, you're not in Moore's store, but you go somewhere in Dallas or something, nobody knows who you are, and you're in there playing, everybody's talking. What do you do? We just played a new place in San Angelo. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's, that's an area that we've always kind of went around. We've done San Marcos and New Braunfels. And, you describe it so well, yeah. you know, because we're looked at as just entertainment. Some people won't take take to you. Mm -hmm. So what I do and what I've learned to do over the years is, number one, if I'm playing a bar where that's where they make their money, I get in the mode of myself. Yes, I'm an entertainer, but I'm also a beer salesman. Mm -hmm. And it's an energy thing, Sam. You, you look at, you find who's who who if they're there after sound check. That's always a good sign because we get we catch people. They'll come back or they'll stay right mm -hmm. after sound check because they liked it. And you find those people and you feed off of them and you go back and forth with the energy. And before you know it, from when everybody was just in the corner talking or just back there shooting pool, mm -hmm. they're up front, they're dancing, they're buying you shots. And that's how you that's how you do it. You just you find someone to sing and play to and it reaches everybody. And that's the reward you get in return. I know exactly what you're talking about. You make eye contact with the, yes. with the one person that's into you, yeah. that's, that's watching you, and that kind of mm -hmm. it kind of multiplies. Man, that's great. And we're already booked there to play. They, that's after yeah. that night, they got us three more shows for the year. So that's that's what you always want to do. That's your goal is to get a rotation of shows. In your music, your music is it's it's blues, but it's rock. I mean, it's what I, who do I compare it to? Let me just try to let me describe your music. I'm loving it already because I got respect for you as an artist. You well, know? <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. Your music is like, um, you know, everybody's easy to say like, oh, B.B. King, but like Tina Turner. I'm saying Tina Turner with the voice, just the, you know, the rock. You have a rock voice with on top of blues. And you've got, you know, you play Prince, you play 
um, you know, you throw cover songs in there. But it it's a very high energy. When the full band, I know from the full band, I've seen you multiple times, that it's a high energy show. And if you've never been to a Wesley Pruitt show, you need to go. Um, I've been to private parties where you've played. I've been to VFWs. I've been to bars and, and stuff like that. It's good. It's good music. And it's you're the probably the most requested uh, artist around, I know, around Van Zandt, Henderson County that there is. So what, what's your first memory of music? What's your first memory of music when you were a baby up until, like, what's the first thing that you heard that you liked? Think about it for a second. I already got it. What is I, that's it? When I was telling you this was meant to be, because I don't think you knew this about me. My parents, when my dad was still alive, and um, it's something that I don't know how I can remember. But Dad used to have a, a 1981 Chevy pickup. one of my favorite trucks that he, that he had. And apparently I was right under two years old. Mm -hmm. But I can remember being on that bench seat, and I remember a white tape with blue letters. Mm -hmm. I remember this all of my life. But that's when he had it, when I was barely two. And I knew I was listening to somebody that it was a guitar that I liked. Mm -hmm. That tape was B.B. King. And I can yeah. remember sitting sitting beside him, riding around the neighborhood. That's highly illegal now, obviously. But, yeah. you know, he's driving five miles per hour. I was his first son. He was proud. And that's the music that he played for me. It was Waylon Jennings and B.B. King. And I remember the B.B. King at that age. Yeah. And that's what, of all the years of my music growing, mm -hmm. you mentioned blues, and that's what I've always gravitated to because that was the first thing that just I really liked that young. Yeah. And – the spark was been lit then, I'm pretty sure. That's wonderful. Hey, I, and I, I remember it. Yeah. I, I don't know how, but yeah. I remember that. So I had, you know, when I was in the car, my dad always was listening to George Strait and Willie Nelson, but my mom had Tina Turner, oh, yeah. the Beach Boys, and, you know, crazy Robert Palmer, you know, like 80s, <laughs> 80s stuff that I love to this day. Um and I'm a fan of all music. I'm a, I'm a fan of every genre. And let's talk about blues for a sec. I watched something on Stevie Ray Vaughan the other day. It was just like, I don't know, it was on Facebook Reels or, or something. It was like a concert from Austin City Limits. Stevie Ray Vaughan playing Voodoo Child from, you know, Jimi Hendrix. Yes. And I love Jimi Hendrix. But this had so much emotion. And that guy played a guitar. I mean, it, is Stevie Ray Vaughan the best player of all time? Who's the best player of all time? That is a question that I'm not able to – and I think as an artist, that's probably why I won't answer it. Mm -hmm. I will say Stevie Ray Vaughan, on a personal level, he's the credit that I give that really, really sent me into saying, okay, huh, that's the guy I want to be like. Yeah. You know, I was, I've always been around music. And he never reached its peak, I can say that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, I – I don't know who the best guitar. I mean, I, there's so many of them that that I like in so many different ways. Yeah. Stevie is my number one. Buddy Guy's my number one living legend. Uh, but Stevie, at age 15, you know, I finally ran across him, and that's what really made me play. So he's my overall all-time favorite. I can't say he's the best, but yeah. I don't. I don't know how to answer. It that. It was incredible. I mean, yeah. I saw this thing. I for, kind of forgot about Steve Ray. I kind of forgot how good he was. And then I saw that, and I was blown away. I watched the entire thing. I couldn't couldn't take my eyes off of it. Um, I remember seeing you play guitar in at high school in um, in uh, the band hall or something. You were playing the guitar, maybe like a white Stratocaster or something. I can't remember. But I remember I was better playing guitar than you. I remember that. I was like, I'm probably better than Wesley Pruitt. And I uh, was, I think, at the time. I have never, I haven't gotten better since then. But you now, you remind me of Stevie Ray Vaughan. And there's like, how, I can never get that good. But tell me, how did you get that good at playing guitar? How did you, how did you, how did you get so damn good? It might have been in the band hall because, uh, Rob Toots was a director, and I I think if you seen me playing then, and it was a white guitar, I was a sophomore going into my junior year. Mm -hmm. And 
that's when I was right around 15. And I just, I started learning and I learned a lot really fast. Mm -hmm. And he threw me in the fire my junior year in high school with the jazz band. Mm -hmm. But I knew I wanted it. And I knew there was so much that I wanted to be like, which was Stevie Ray Vaughan. And to be honest, I just dug into it and I spent hours a day not really practicing, but I, I've always had an ear and I was trying to play everything that I, that came my way that I wanted to play. And somewhere between then and over a few years, something something happened. And I haven't looked back since then. You played the tuba mm -hmm. in the band under Rob Toops. Yep. Rob Toops was one of my favorite teachers I've ever had in my entire life to include, you know, I went to West Point College. I had some awesome instructors. Something about him, uh, of course, I was in the band up and through my till my freshman year. After that, I stopped because I was focused more on sports. But he had a huge impact because he was a no, no bullshit. He didn't sugarcoat anything. And he was one of the best teachers, in, in inspirational <clears throat> teachers. Did you? You're spot on, Sam. You're, you're spot on. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've, I've gotten to have even more personal conversations with him. He's played with me over the years because he's yeah. still one of my most energetic, fun drummers to play with. But you, you hit the nail on the head. And two teachers out of all of my career through high school, college, Mrs. Nitson and Nick, Rob Toots yeah. are always – at the top and musically speaking you know rob won't take credit for this but i remind him as often as i can i mean he's the biggest reason why i'm able to say hey that's where it started mm -hmm. and that vice you know mm -hmm. beyond just teaching music just the conversations and 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 because he went through it you know yeah. he's a musician he's 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 a hell of a musician yeah he he he, he is such a huge reason why I've been able to to maintain and even get here to to this present day. That's Rob Toops, and no BS, definitely. Yeah, uh, I mean it's it's hard. You you work you work your ass off. <laughs> I remember being a part of that band, and it was like, I mean, it was like the army. I mean, it was no other <laughs> no other school band was like that at the time. I mean, he's in there yelling like boom. And I remember he hit his foot on the the podium oh, he snapped yeah, snap loud as hell i couldn't even snap that loud and uh <laughs> super fingers yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know who taught me how to play guitar uh steve jennings you remember steve jennings yeah i was in boy scouts so i took a few lessons but steve jennings was in the boy scouts he was a uh, he was like you know 16 17 i was 11 and uh he was playing metallica you know, Nirvana, Guns N' Roses, and I was like, teach me that. And then I, because I knew all those songs by heart, and I could just, pew. and then to this day, I can, I can have an ear, I can play, if I hear a song, I can play it. You know, I can play on, you know, I can pick up a song and sound it out. I'm good with, with sounds and chords and stuff. I can't play lead worth a, worth a damn. <laughs> but, full, disc I mean, I don't practice. That's, and that's the whole, that's the whole deal. You know, you need 10,000 hours of practice to be good. To be, you know, you have 10,000 hours easily. Um, and I could do it if I want. You know, life got in the way. I started doing other things, which I'm proud of. But it takes practice to be good at anything. And, man, you've you've done it with guitar. And uh, But, yeah, Rob Toops is, I mean, I, I hope that he, you know, there's, you know, there's, um, there's so many kids in Canton that, that, were impacted by him, and, and of course there we could we could name a lot of teachers of like course, that. Of course, but he was one that I, I know I haven't talked about him on the podcast yet, but really solid guy and um, solid teacher. Uh, I agree one hundred percent. Then I think the world of that whole family. I think the mm -hmm. world of them. Really yeah. good people. Yeah, and Mark. Yeah, Mark. Oh yeah. Oh Me yeah. And our buddies. So. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> That's so, my boy. So. You practiced a lot. He puts you in the jazz band. And you, you got Ryan Sickle in that thing? Yep. Ryan Sickle was on drums. We had Matt uh -huh. Selby on bass. That was a rhythm section. Yeah. Candace, Candace uh, Light at the time was, was a piano player. Okay, cool. That's a, that's a hot man right there. Sickle. We was, traveled. He, he had us traveling. Yeah. People wanted to hear the high school jazz band, and that, that was really cool. I always wanted to be in that jazz band, I tell you. Who, what was the guy's name? 
the white guy that played guitar before you. Um, Had to be Calvin Gainey. Calvin Gain. Such Gainey. a hoss. That dude could shred. Oh, I remember yeah. he played Johnny Be Good a lot. I know. I always <laughs> remember him playing that, and I was so I was like, God, I want to play Johnny Be Good so bad. And yeah. um, he had a red Stratocaster. Sure did. Mm-hmm. Uh, just watching him. Yeah, damn, that guy was good. Um, he showed me some licks. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I hope he's still playing. Well, I hope so. He's yeah. a great piano player, too. Really? Oh, yeah. That's good. All right. Um, the business. Of, let's talk the business of music. We kind of we kind of touched on it. Mm-hmm. What's your day like? All right. You're going to play this show tonight. To, to walk me through your day that you got a show. <sighs> We're gonna do. Let's let's stay with present day. It's a lot more interesting than what yeah. it was, you know, before before the kid. Yeah. So, uh, like like a Thursday or Friday or Saturday. We'll say it's it's Friday. Mm-hmm. So, um, morning duties. You know, the kid has to go to school, and uh, we'll probably touch base on me hot shotting here part time. But it's business meetings. Uh, it's always social media. You know, networking is such a tool that that a lot of people can can get lazy on, and mm-hmm. they don't engage with their fans, or they're not at least trying to put some type of content up. Yeah, um, that along with business meetings, and then you kind of schedule that within a four hour time. You know, I talk to the agent normally every day. Um, Wesley, you're booked here. Who's your agent? Sherry Watson, a star talent agency. Been mm-hmm. with her. I, I don't know exactly how many years. It's been a while. And she she beefed us up quite a bit. That's been a blessing to have her. She books the shows. She books the shows, and she does a little bit of the management 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 part too. Yeah. So it's it's that's every day. You know, you, mm-hmm. you commit to doing. If it's not a business meeting, it's it's if it's and if it's not just social networking, every day you have to be doing something that's tied in with music. Something to um, advance the yeah music career. I mean, yeah. you have to yeah. You know, you get a day off if you take it every now and then, but there's always something going on. Mm-hmm. If it's not that, it's writing. You know, mm-hmm. um, but that's 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 what today was like, you know, for three or four hours. And then if I have a load, I take a load and then I may get a phone call from one of my really best friends about doing a podcast. Yeah. Pick the kid up. There's homework. Hang out with him and you go do sound check. Mm-hmm. Then you do sound check. You eat. You play a show mm-hmm. and you put all the energy out that you can for that night and you do it all over again the next day. And you get home. When do you get home from a show? If it's a close show, I'm I'm in you know anywhere between eleven thirty and twelve. Um, if it's you know a few hours away, which we I I, I would rather drive in. You know yeah. we'll get in at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You know, so my schedule, you know, and I have I have a great support system, but with my with my personal schedule, I'm up every morning, but I'm up late every night, so I can drive in from those shows. You know, when we're three or four hours, what two or three hours away? If it's more than three and a half four hours, we spend a night come back the next day when you're playing a show take me through the you know, set list um take me through take me through a normal set list western Pruitt band is not known to have set lists okay All which right. yeah. we'll, we'll get a little bit more it st- i still don't want to have set lists because you understand this yeah. sam it doesn't matter where you play you know if if we're just and some bands are straight by the book and they're structured mm-hmm and those are some of the best shows you can go see. Um, I've done that, but to me, there's a there's a, a bit of elevation. There's a musical high that you don't quite get to. And what I've learned over the years is they're already coming to see what you do. You know, you work your ass off to get to that level. So they're coming to see the Wesley Pritt Band. They know they're going to get some type of cool blues song, some type of honky-tonk, anything in between. But... If I'm truly doing my job, I'm feeding off of them. And they're not going to give you those four or five songs that are supposed to be nets on that set list. Right. You got to be, and, and, and my band knows this. You're on your toes in my with my show. You got to be ready to flip the script and go into something totally different. Yeah. You know, and that's, there's, there's a bunch of songs that we've accrued over the years, cover songs, originals, mm-hmm. and we have to be ready to, 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 to take a left turn or to do a U-turn or take a right turn. So That's, It's a song list more than a set list. You're working the crowd. Yeah. Is it like making love to a woman? Are you trying to ease them? Are you, are you just trying to give them a little taste at the beginning? Or, or are you, you know, whenever I start playing, 
I, I play something that's not it's not my best, but it's you know it's kind of like music to give people okay here's some live music, and then you know you 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 know what songs that you oh, play yeah. that always are always are crowd favorites right oh yeah oh yeah and you know you want to hit that on the climax mm-hmm. you know or whatever uh, and you can mess that up that, that's that I've messed that up plenty of times or I'm I'm start drinking I get too drunk and I can't. You know, I can't perform as well. <laughs> I mean, it's just so much like <laughs> like life, right? Um, but are you like James Brown? Were you are you are you finding the uh, guys in the band? Are you are you? I mean, do you have a meeting afterwards and say, hey, "Listen, man, you need to step your you know step your plan up." Because you know, I I have docked guys <laughs> over over from years ago. <laughs> that doesn't work that well if you're not James Brown, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're <laughs> Wesley Brown. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's. <laughs> I just had so many stories uh, thinking about, but you, you know, he he was known for that, and and it takes a while to get those type of musicians to where it's a look. Yeah, you know, yeah, of course. And 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 I've had to better myself. You know, most of the crowd will never know. A musician could tell when if I'm looking to the left. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this damn drummer, man. He just he's keep falling behind the beat. Yeah. So I have to check him. Mm-hmm. The guys I play with now, it's Calvin Sheffield on bass and uh, Mikey Smiley, man, I'm just drums. We always have a fourth player. But the rhythm section I got now is the best I've ever had next to when I had John Martinez and, and uh, Curtis Randall subbing in. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when when the you know when I fired one of the band members and the band went separate ways. But there's no docking. Right. Um, they just, they just, they're ready, they're ready, and those days of of having to 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 remind them, hey man, you 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 know, they get it. Yeah, they're men. They they're get professionals. It. Yeah, and they get it now. Man, that's so cool. Uh, I just love a band. I love a drums, a rhythm section, and everything, and then let you take liberties. You know, you want to hit a solo, you know, and you love to do that um, when you're working the crowd. Um. So you're playing the night at Moore's store tomorrow at Wind Down. The, the new album Gypsy Soul is going to be available in three weeks. Are, you're selling these. You sell CDs at the shows. Oh yeah, yeah. We got a full full merchandise thing with CDs and shirts. Shirts. Uh, we're going to release it digitally first. I don't. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to have hard copies until right close to the time where where we have actual CD release dates. Mm-hmm. But it it'll be available. You know, Amazon Music, Spotify, Pan, you know, uh, what, iTunes, and it'll be available through all of that. Okay. Um, let's let's shift gears. Let's do it. What's going on? What's going on in the country right now with with racism? Let's talk about this. Let's do it. I I, I just read a book um, called Robert E. Lee and Me. And. Robert E. Lee's West Point graduate, went to West Point. He's a very re- well-renowned military figure. This book's w- written by a current, the head of the history department at West Point. He's from Alexandria, Virginia, where Robert E. Lee's from. He grew up idolizing Robert E. Lee. This book says, boy, was I wrong growing up. And let me, before, let me explain myself. When I was growing up, when we talked about the Civil War in school, we didn't talk about slavery, hardly. It was kind of a, um, it was kind of a an afterthought. We talked about states' rights, and we talked about uh, uh, the Northern aggression um, type deal. Mm-hmm. So, when the Civil War happened. The, most of the cadets from the South went back home to fight for the Confederacy, and, the, and the, so they, 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 you know, they split. You know, Robert E. Lee, he was a com- superintendent of West Point. He fought in the Mexican War. They went down there and whipped Mexico pretty bad, and came back. And then he, he didn't want to do it, but you know, he 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 fought for the Confederacy. Uh, but most of these guys, you know, a lot of them owned slaves, and. Um, there's no doubt, and what what the book talks about is, there's not a there's not a doubt that the Confederacy was stood up because of slavery, and that's what the war was over. 
And come to find out in in college, when we talked about like the Alamo and Texas history, which I'm a fan of, I'm a fan of Davy Crockett, and I thought I was at one point uh, related to William Travis at the Alamo. Mm -hmm. That war was not really about just independence from Mexico. That was also about slavery because m slavery was illegal in Mexico, and Texans were people were moving in from the United States and having slaves and having you know, farms and whatnot. So this book is like shining a light, like after the Civil War is over, South lost, there's been a narrative since then to save face of what actually happened. And of course it was a bad deal. And there's no doubt that, um, you know, African Americans have certain disadvantages systemically um than that I would have um so that book's opened my eyes at the same on the flip side and I had this conversation with my good friends say I'm at West Point you know back in 1860 whatever when the Civil War is about to break out and I'm there and there's a there's a war about to break out do I fight against my brother and my family on the northern side because I'm, a, you know, I honor the flag, whether I'm against slavery or for it, whether my parents own slaves or not, what do I do? Do I come down here and fight against my brother or my, my family? And that's a, that was a hard deal. Um, so 60% um, or they would say of the Confederate soldiers didn't own slaves, didn't know, didn't support slavery, maybe, who knows. But they did, you know, John Brown raided Harper's Ferry and tried to arm the slaves. And then everybody was saying, hey, we're going to arm the slaves and they're going to kill all the slave owners, kill all the uh, the white people. So a lot of them are fighting just because they're like, well, we're being invaded by these Yankees. Why are you fighting? I don't own slaves, but they're going to come invade my hometowns you know I'm fighting to get them out of here mm -hmm. so rough deal but it's definitely whitewashed if you would when I was growing up about history was slavery wasn't it you know I watched Django Unchained and it's it's you're like wow that's that went kind of over the top but that's how it was that's 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 true how the history was mm -hmm. the the treatment um I don't know if I did all that justice, but, you know, I, everything that's going on now, I, I don't think a lot of folks understand, um, you know, some of the history of of post-Civil War, you know, Jim Crow and Confederate monuments uh, built in the Civil Rights era and the Martin Luther King era to as a, hey, remember where you're at. Mm-hmm. So how do we, with everything going on right now, what's your take on it? You're, I've got about, eh, I got, everybody, every white guy says this, but I've got several black friends in the army. You're probably my best black friend here. I got Pat Hooper, who's my neighbor, who does CrossFit with me. He's the only black cowboy I know. But having, I want to have this conversation with you right now, uh, and we don't, we may not have any answers, but. What's your take on some of this stuff? You you touched based on so many words, and I'm I'm glad we've circled to this. The conversation has to be had, and I think, if anything, no order of steps, but just talking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone needs to be able to get to a point to where it's not uncomfortable to talk about it. You know, male, male female, you know, everybody. And that's where we are right now. And to touch base on history and to come all the way to where we are now, um, I think the words that I use with any conversation that I've had, and, and, and these conversations really popped up a lot during COVID, you know, mm -hmm. because uh, maybe we'll get to a personal side of that later, maybe, maybe another podcast. But there's two words that I always remind myself to have, and I try to promote that at the same time and respect for one 
Empathy mm-hmm. is the second word. No order. And when you brought up how a guy back then had to make a choice to do I fight against my brothers because I do believe that in, in that flag. Mm-hmm. I may not believe in slavery, but I still have something pulling me here that that's that's my home. I want to defend my homeland. And I have to be able to respect that guy's choice. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to try my damnness to understand exactly why. I'm not going to look at what he did that might have made my life hell or or my or my family hell years to come. I want to understand exactly where he came from first. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because I I've learned that as well that even though in our school systems, you know, what little we learned, there's there's probably I'll say 90%, maybe 85, 90% of what was never taught. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we can go down that hole and, and try to question why it wasn't taught, but we do have brains for a reason to really research and really find the truth to learn. Yeah. So that happened back then, and what hasn't changed is I don't think enough people have really – I'm, I'm going to speak from my side first. Okay. I don't think enough people have really tried to at least understand – what happened then people get upset myself included at times it may be a human thing if they see a black man hanging from a tree Mm -hmm. they see four or five white men circling around praising that they just hunger you know what Mm -hmm. that's the image that they always see yeah they sometimes we forget that even though that my great great granddad might have owned slaves well this little granddaughter comes along 1927 and she's going to be taught that but Mm -hmm. there is a window sam to where she didn't know that at first yeah when she first seen that little black girl Mm -hmm. instantly what did she want to do play she wanted to play with that little girl yeah and our minds are not able to see that image to get ticked off or our minds are not able to see from another standpoint to say that that black guy just came and stole half of my crop that, that, that I can't feed my family with because even though he was hungry, he stole my crops from my family. So mm-hmm. I'm going to hate him. Yeah. So there's a disconnect is what I'm saying. There's a disconnect, and I think that's because I'm not having a conversation. Yeah. So I make a choice to at least understand where somebody was then, okay, and I block out that image of what was done wrongfully. So we come to 2021, and we have all of these years of trying to figure out why is it still bouncing back mm-hmm. every so often? Who do we blame? That's not me. I don't blame anybody but myself for anything if something happens. Mm-hmm. So we're having a conversation. You read a book recently. Recently. You're yeah. 37 years old, right? Mm-hmm. And if – if I wanted to fill your head, but I'm not, I'm just being honest. If I think of Sam Dean, mm-hmm. I don't think of anybody that's going to be racist. I don't, I don't have any negative thing. When I think of Sam Dean, I think of somebody I went to school with. I think of somebody that's successful. Mm-hmm. I think of somebody that's a good husband, a good father, good family person, and just a damn good person that I call one of my best friends. That's what I think of Sam Dean. Okay. Mm-hmm. You read a book recently. Mm-hmm. you've served you've you've honored this country fought for this country and you just now read something that you didn't think you probably would ever read and did you even think that there would be something at this late in the age to make you think differently just to see a different side maybe not right but guess what i'm going to do anytime you have a question and we have a conversation i'm going to have time to talk to you about it because I don't know where to fit what's happened, but I think if anything, if we have the conversation, if we're able to just not say, oh, man, everybody's throwing a race card or this person is automatically just don't understand. So he don't he, he just blocks out racism. I think if we can just not be that way and just listen and have empathy when somebody's telling you that 
and I'll be one of them because I'm not a cele- I'm I'm not a local celebrity in every town. Mm-hmm. But with what's happened with video, don't think that I've I haven't been pulled over for driving two miles per hour different. Especially I was going to Mississippi a couple of years ago. We were heading mm-hmm. to Georgia three years ago. I didn't know where the hell I was at. And why did the thought cross my mind? Why did my sats player in the back seat get scared that we just got pulled over? Mm-hmm. It's because we've had those instances. Yeah, I'm the biggest person I think that I'm going to advocate, you know, for believing in in a peace officer. Those are my brothers and sisters. That's a whole different story. Yeah, but there is a disconnect, and I don't think enough people allow themselves to just listen and have empathy to just say maybe there is a problem here. And I think the respect level goes down automatically when they get thrown in the bots and it progresses. It progresses. Not enough people. What's the first time that you were discriminated against when you were a kid? Did you remember? In in, in any instance? Any instance. <laughs> <laughs> the first time. I know there's probably thousands. If I'm making sense. But, yeah, the, I, that I can remember the very first time. It was from a friend that I have been friends with for years mm-hmm. uh, at school. And, man, I, I guess guys and girls, I guess you kind of, I don't know what age, scientifically you kind of have a crush on a girl or a girl has a crush on you. But I remember we were, it's a white girl, we were really good friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and as long as we were just friends at school, it was fine. But I remember it got to the point to where – now, nothing was going on sexually. We were too young for that. But I remember it got to the point to where it was time to – we can play a little bit more. And, you know, hey, Wesley, you're invited to this birthday party. And, you know, my parents would be there and all that cool stuff. And, yeah, man, I remember meeting the girl's dad. And just of him seeing the sight of his girl being that friendly mm-hmm. with the little black boy. At that time, Sam, I didn't know why he was so mean. Because he didn't treat the other little boys that she was friends with. you know. So at the time, I didn't know why he was so mean to me. So he pulled you to the side. He, no, he, he gave me that look. I don't want you around my daughter. Oh, okay. So I wasn't yeah. able to understand why he was that way. It took me growing up. Yeah. Because you always reflect back on things mm-hmm. that happen. And I think I was probably maybe in the, maybe third or fourth grade. Third or fourth grade. And and that that's that's the first instance I can think of when when I was. I I mean, is that discrimination? I don't know if you would call it that because it no, wasn't it, verbally. But I mean, it, he didn't like it. You were treated differently. Yeah. I mean, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Um. And then today, when you go play a show, tell me what happens today. Still to this day, where yeah. where you're discriminated against. This this is the part this is the part where sometimes I don't like being a so called musician slash mm-hmm. celebrity in most places. Because I'm not always treated in a normal way. So more often than not, I'm a I'm treated to where that's Wesley Pruitt. Super nice in my face, you mm-hmm. know, and, 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 and it's great. Um I think the last time recently, what's what what happened? You know, I I did. Some people don't believe in the mask. I did promote the mask. I I, I thought it was just try to be universal and try to help whoever I could and not do anything with with COVID. And I remember wearing a mask. And this was this wasn't far from my hometown. I'll just I don't want to single a business out. I don't want to single yeah. anybody out. But I remember having a mask on and looking enough, being able to hide myself enough to wear. I'm walking, and I recognize this gentleman. He didn't have a mask on, no big deal. And something that that I've become more over the years, you know, you always have to speak with people. But I I, I want to make a point to where if I speak to you, it's not to just to be that I was raised by good parents and I'm just being nice. I want to actually, if I ask you how you're doing or, you know, whatever, I want you to know that I really sincerely mean it. Mm-hmm. And I remember this guy looked me straight in the eye. I don't know if he was pissed because I had a mask on. I don't know if he was pissed because he just didn't wasn't having it that day until I took my mask off outside the store. I spoke to him. He gave me a glaring look. Didn't say a damn thing to me. And I'm no big deal. He paid for his stuff. I paid for my Altoids and I had some Gatorade Zero. 
Mm-hmm. On my way out to my truck, I pull my mask off. He happened to park beside me. He was he was he was he was he was pulling out, going to the right. <laughs> then he seen me. Whole demeanor changed of how how it is when he sees Wesley Pruitt. Yeah, and and I let that stuff go. You know, he he's not a person that I say I'm really good friends with. You know, yeah. um, but that's the most recent time. You know, mm-hmm. why treat me differently? All I was to begin with was just a guy that genuinely asked, hey, man, how you doing? You're mm-hmm. just speaking. I, I try to speak to people and, and mean it. And during that instance, it was nothing. But later on, pull the mask off. It's me, and it's a whole different person. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah. So I don't I don't know how to fix it, Sam, but I, I always <laughs> go back to, like I say, I mean. I'm afraid I do that to, some, like, everybody, though. I mean, <laughs> if I don't recognize him, no. But. I just he, try to be He looked at nice. you. He didn't talk to you and was very rude to you. Very rude. Because you didn't explain that part enough, I don't think. Um, or maybe I didn't hear that part. Well, I didn't go yeah. into detail. But, I mean, okay. you know, we, we if I got a mask on, I'm, I'm, you're going to make eye contact first. Yeah. You know, you don't have to speak to somebody, but. You, you know, should. You're in, in your eyes, I think a person's eyes tells a whole, that that's 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 a whole different story. You know, and it was like, I don't fucking talk to you. So I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Um, that's is, so. That's we are in a church. right That now. is just the most. That's just the most recent thing. I I got yeah. stories, and I, I mean, you don't want to relive them either. I, I get it. Um, well, thanks for just entertaining that thought I had. And yeah, I read that book. I mean, I read several. I read a few books. Of course. Um, but it's it's such a sensitive deal uh, right now, and. Um, so you gave some advice, like let's let's have a communication about it. Let's see let's see both sides of it. Let's yeah. educate both sides. Um, so how do we get out of it? How do how are cops again? How are we? You know, of course, we're not going to solve anything today. But um, you know, I have cops in my family. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you you like I mean, you respect police officers, um there's bad there's there's shitheads in every group. There is. When I was in the army and got to West Point, I was like, Man, it's gonna be the best of the best. Got there and I was like, Man, there's terrible people here. You know, a few of them are terrible guys. And then I got to the infantry, I was like, It's only gonna be the the best of the best here. Still a couple of idiots. Went to Ranger School, only best of the best in Ranger, you know, a couple of idiots still. You know, so there's going to be a couple of idiot cops. Um, but it's not just a couple of things happening. It seems like all the time. And I don't know if it's is it media that we see it all the time now and we can't hide it or what. And, you know, with groups of people, you automatically, you're automatically more warm to people that look like you, right? So throughout time... Um, you know, you, you, groups of people, different color skins. You know, it's just it's like that. America's a great place now. We got all everybody here. Mm-hmm. Just so happens we got a dark history, a, a terrible history of s- slavery. One of the last places to get rid of it, United States of America. After World War II or World War One or some some war, the white guys coming home got the G, got the GI Bill and got you got the you know, got to buy a house, the uh, the VA loans. The black mm-hmm. soldiers didn't. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people think that, and it's true, you know, some a lot of whites can own land, a lot of land, and a lot of black families didn't because the guys that fought in the war, they didn't get the same benefits. Mm-hmm. You got that going on. I mean, there's just a number of things. Those are the things that, you know, I've just paid attention to. Um, so I get it. I don't get it. I have no, you know, sitting in my seat, in my skin, I have no, I cannot, I do not know how you feel at all. I, I do not, you know, to be discriminated against. Worst time I've ever been discriminated my entire life. I was at a restaurant and somebody asked me when St. Patrick's Day was, <laughs> you know, because I look like yeah, a leprechaun. Right. I got you. That's one time my you. entire life, one time, one time, <laughs> and you've had th- probably th- tens of thousands of times. It's happened. Um, 
I don't think it's as hard as as, as what what it's made out to be. I think the media does highlight it. Um, we have to look at if 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 you understand if you're able to see how we can use let's use the term bad apples, mm-hmm. and we know the system didn't start yesterday. So the system didn't didn't start with this many least you know racism things going on or, or racist things. So we have to go back where it started, and we have to realize that it has carried over, mm-hmm. you know, till today. And we can there's so much we can touch base on, but just going off of what you said, if we use let's say a thousand people, mm-hmm. let's go higher because I I'm so optimistic. Um, with this, and and I and I try to see the most the biggest positive light. Let's say for every fifty thousand people, we'll find one racist person. Just spitting out numbers. Yeah. So after you compile that, and you get up to a hundred thousand, you're at two. If you get the two hundred thousand, you're at four, and so on and so on. This is a huge country, big mm-hmm. population. At some point. Even if it's on my side of the fence, if if it's if if it's somebody that I'm seeing, if they're doing anything or saying anything racist, I think at some point, another word that I build up with the band, not just unity, is a word called accountability. I think to really get past this, it's not just dissecting where the problems originated from and how we can reform it enough to where it's more fit for everybody. We got to call people out. Mm-hmm. I think. In, in in the most respectful heart way is not turn a blind eye to it and call people out for it. You know, because anybody can change if they want to. There, there's a documentary that I was watching to where there was a black man that was out who still has friends that are in the Klan. And they've talked for years, and I think it's up to 200 and something that he's talked to enough to where they understand how this gentleman is, and they're not in the Klan anymore. Mm-hmm. If one person can do 200 and some people over the years, just think how much we can change if we actually, instead of saying, hey, that's just Jim Bob or that's just Reggie or whatever, talk to them, understand them, but call it out. Because they know, they know it's wrong. They choose to be that way, but they know it's wrong. I hate that officers right now by so many people they get looked at under a scope to where F the popo, you can't trust none of them. That's, that's BS. Mm -hmm. I know that for a fact. And that's the hardest job. It is in the world. It is. Cause you're, you're going to, you're going to pull somebody over and who knows what the hell they're met. Yeah. It's, you got a target on your back regardless. You don't want to pull anybody over. No, you want anybody. Exactly. Exactly. And you're probably like, God, I hope they're not black. You know? Yeah. It's like, oh, I bet shit. They're, I know they're yeah. thinking that They're now. black. Damn it. Yeah. You know? Okay. <sighs> we don't fuck this up. You know, don't screw this up. Mm-hmm. Who wants to be a cop right now? That's the sad part. I've heard that. And and, and I hate that. Yeah. But, but Sam, I, I still I still go back to my first comment with the accountability part because, and I know this as well. I mean, we're, we're in Canton. Canton's a small town. I could say some things that I won't. Mm-hmm. But it'll be off the record, um, uh, with a video that I that, that I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you that video pretty soon. But even on the inside of things, there's been enough people that have let things go mm-hmm. when they knew that that guy shouldn't have went way over the the ledge with 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 his words or with his actions. I th- I think we just have to start calling people out. Not shunning them, not trying to get rid of them and and mm-hmm. and and spit on them, but call them out. What you're doing is wrong, and won't you try to better yourself to do what's right? I and I and I, I'm not saying I know what's going to fix it, but I think it does start there at least. You know, yeah. call the people out that are that 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 are they're making making that officer look bad. Yeah. If it's if it's a bad officer, call them out. You know, don't make the rest of us yeah. look because, yeah, I, I, I hate it. I hate that people have such a negative, ne- negative aspect towards towards police officers. And they're there when you need them. Always. You know, 
and yeah, it sucks. You hate it. I hate it. It. it I feel terrible for police officers right now, and they've always had a hard job. And now it's even harder. And and I hope kids are still wanting to be police because we need policemen. Um, shift gears a little bit. I went in Robert Mackey's house when I was in eighth or ninth grade. I can't remember. He had a black Jesus on the wall. Mm -hmm. I was like, who the hell is that? Mm -hmm. To myself, I don't think I said that to him. <laughs> <laughs> what color was Jesus? <laughs> he wasn't white. <laughs> he didn't look like Charlton Heston or, or whatever, you know? Like, which. <laughs> <laughs> this is cracking me up, man. Uh, so they had black Jesus on the wall, which, you know, Jesus definitely had dark skin. But, you know, that's just one of those things that we, we make them out to be uh, somebody, you know, all of the, even in my church now, all the, all the Jesus movies and everything, this is a white actor. So even that little bitty thing is a way that a certain race wants to view a certain thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of thought it was kind of funny, but uh. no, I, I got I got the same <laughs> I got the same one in, in my yeah. house. You know, it's 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 depicting Jesus as more of a just a darker complexion as 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 being Jewish, I believe. Is, yeah. is what what the what the artist mm -hmm. intended when I read up on it. But I I got I got a and and so many people have came over and. They're they're not they're, they're just stunned because it's not your typical Jesus yeah. that they're used to seeing. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> uh, oh man, we need to talk to each other more about hard subjects like that, and that's oh, how yeah. we're gonna get through it. I think so, and and and, and mean and, and and actually open up and want to understand. Like I I want to understand more of what drove that person. Yeah, you know, because I want to listen to them and not assuming that you know where someone's coming from yeah because that i think that i think you know it's easy to say oh it's education you know like a, i know about history more than what i was taught in school or by my parents you know i've I've learned outside of texas i've been to new york and then you know i've i've kind of got a little more worldly education maybe but it's really the empathy of being able to put myself in your shoes and and not trying to tell you that i have black friends I've got two, three black friends. I'm not racist. Or I know how you feel. I've seen it on TV. You know, I've seen this, and I have no idea how you feel about it. And I just know that you feel differently than I do because you come from a different angle. And I think that's understand, have mutual respect where you can, you know, you, this is how I, you know, man, what do I need to do? How do I, you know, uh, Give me some help, man. Help. Let me do it. I want it. I want the United States of America to be the best damn country in the world. I want my son to grow up in a beautiful, vibrant, safe, badass country. Mm -hmm. And I hope it lasts forever. I don't want it to crumble. Right. I, you want the same thing. Definitely. And, and we're on the same team. We're Americans. It's like the army, man. You throw you you join the army and they. They say there weren't one color here, mother ever. You know, we're all green. You know, yeah. <laughs> you learn real quick. There's no difference between anybody. You know, it's <laughs> you just you're all suffering together, yeah. and, <laughs> and uh, you know you can joke about stuff. But you know, I, you know my, my picture up there. That's Christian Abney. He's a he was a helicopter pilot um, in the army. Mm -hmm. Good guy. He went to Michigan grad school. He's from Rhode Island. Uh, I went home. His dad was a his dad's a successful politician in, in Rhode Island. And he's a badass guy. He's still he's still still friends. And uh, he was my first roommate, one of my first roommates, and I love him to death. But you know, he he educated me on a lot of stuff. Uh, and uh, I had two soldiers die in Afghanistan. One was Ezra Dawson, African American from Las Vegas, stand up comedian, saved my life once. Uh, the best of America, and and there's a picture of him over here. Check it out afterwards. But um, we're all Americans, and and you're my friend, you're my brother, and uh, appreciate you answering these questions. It's hard to talk. I know my heart was racing when we were talking about the racism stuff, and I know you, your voice went up. You were you know playing that stuff back in your head. Yeah. 
I think your heart was elevated a little bit. It, it was. I just I see things so much differently now over the last two or three years of just transforming. I used to get angry at a lot of other stuff, but I just I see it different. Yeah. And and I, I think we can get to his – because my thoughts are always leaving this place better for my kid, for my yeah. kids, and I'm with you on that, you know. So tonight you got more store. Yes, sir. What time? 8 p.m., acoustic duo. 8 p.m., and then Saturday, May 1st at uh, Wind Down. Full band, wind, yeah. Full wind band down. at the Wind Down. I love Le- Leah. Leah is is Leah felt, yeah. she. I I just think a lot of her, and we usually play there probably probably about two two times a year, full band. You know, it's not a it's not a it's not a it's not the business thing of it. It's 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 yeah. not about money there. It's just doing something in government, your hometown. Government shut Leah down for a while. Yeah. And yeah, thank God they survived. Mm-hmm. Who knows the hardships they went through? They shut me down for two and a half months at CrossFit, and we're not yeah. near back to where we were. I feel uh, it. But they, you know, place little mom and pop, play, you know, Applebee's is going to be okay. Mm-hmm. But places like, uh, you know, wind down, mom and pop places that provide jobs, they provide, you know, it's just small business that needs to be supported. Yeah, it was it was a struggle. I think I think a lot of us that did make it, you know, I think mm-hmm. the light there's there's a light that we can see. Did you get coronavirus? I never got it. Yeah. Not that I know of. You right. know, some of the yeah. symptoms fit around. Mm-hmm. February of last last year, but I don't. I never was. I ne- never tested positive. Yeah. Lost family members to it, and some close friends. But mm. yeah, it's. I understand pretty nasty deal. I I don't think I ever got it. Ashley got it. I never tested positive. I probably had it and didn't know I had it. You mm-hmm. know, and uh, hopefully we'll get through that and we can get on with it. I just want to go to a Rangers or a Mavericks game and not pay a thousand dollars for a ticket, you know, because mm-hmm. there's there's separate so spaced every, out and, and more money. And yeah, and you know, it's a little, it's crazy. <laughs> I think we're getting there, Sam. Yeah. I really do. I, th- I think I think we're getting to yeah. a, and I hope hopefully we'll all. I know me personally, you know, there were there were things that we always take certain things for granted. Mm-hmm. But when we went, you know, I went without. I got I I I'm not burned out. I got burned out years ago, and I don't want to hold, hold too much time. But when I first got to play in front of a live audience, it was so much appreciated. Because even that, sometimes we there's steps that that I've really appreciated twelve, fifteen years ago that I kind of lost a little bit over time from doing this for so long. But getting to perform for people now, it, it's so so grateful for it you know and 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 i think it's 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 coming coming around full circle we're gonna get to where we can have a packed house yeah and and do do the big the big festivals you know like the dogwood festival in atlanta Mm -hmm. georgia just something i'm I'm so ready for that i think it's all coming back yeah and then hopefully it comes back even better than it was and we'll appreciate it more yeah and you know some of the things like we joke about like washing your hands Mm mm-hmm like some people need to wash their damn hands, <laughs> yes. you know. Like yes. <laughs> everybody's bitching about washing their hands. Wash your damn hands. Just wash them. Some people walk around never wash their hands mm-hmm. ever. Yep. Unbelievable. Yep. <laughs> uh, I don't like people close to me. There you go. You know, if I don't like to hug, I don't. You know, I'll hug. You know, my wife and you know people. You know, I like to my friends, whatever, but I don't, you know, you're a guy that, you know, people probably everybody in the audience wants to come up and hug you, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, uh, but I think some of these things we've implemented are going to be good things in the future. You know, like we get a little, little privacy, maybe a little more, you don't get as sick as often. You don't get a cold as often. You don't get flu, you know, you know, chicken pox, whatever you want to call it. Um, so anyway, all right. I'm with you, buddy. (laughs) What's your, uh, last before we go, I have two more questions. If you, you have time. We're going to cut it short, but I, uh, I mean, we're going to cut it tight, but I'm going to call to school when I leave so I can tell them I'm going to be coming up there to get them out of school. Um, we're good. We're good. What's your favorite song that you've ever written? Favorite song or just – I got a lot of favorite songs. What's the one What's the one that, you, that you're most proud of that you penned that you – that you want people to listen to. I'm going to speak about this, and and the the girl that I wrote this about, she listened to podcasts, and hopefully she doesn't get ticked off of me for doing it. But 
the answer I'm going to give you is the hardest song I ever written. Mm-hmm. And the reason why it was the hardest song, I've I've written songs for years to where uh, in my early songs, it might have been something kind of happy and I, you know, I wanted to write about something cool and that's a mm-hmm. level of writing, you know. The second level that I that I went through was being able to just pour something out of, of life experiences and knowing that you're so vulnerable to people that are hearing it and you're giving them a piece of something that in this case, you know, it brought you down and you're singing about it. I mean, cocaine whiskey is one of them. Mm-hmm. Gypsy soul is one of those songs. Gone, gone, gone. Poor man blues. Those are all songs that, that at a level of writing, I was able to just give you something that, that, that I lived. I, I, I write what I live, what I, what, what I've experienced, but, to have Rosewood Studios say this and, and have my bass player, Calvin Sheffield, my brother, say this. I wrote a song uh, around January of 2000 and I'm going to say, I guess, 19. And the spot I was in was I was with a girl who I wanted to marry. We made plans to get married and we were on a break. Um, But I knew how much I loved this girl, you know, there's still love there I don't think all of that goes away but we were on a break and even back then I didn't know I was losing her but I was losing her and she was already pulling away I sat down and I I don't mind I don't believe in being an alpha male I mean I was I was an emotional wreck you know I was in tears and I was getting getting to just a dark spot because I'm like man the the family that that, that we grew together you know and 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 her that we were forming you know, I felt it li- losing, leaving. But the song that I wrote, and I, I say this is my favorite because I was able to get past everything dark and as sad as I was and as emotional wreck that I was, I wrote a song and it was a love song about how her and I kind of, you know, the story tells about just her coming around a corner of of a, of a venue that I'm playing and as soon as I, like, I felt her come through the door. And I was like, she's here. One minute later, she paid a cover, which, I, you know, I always have on the guest list. And she comes around the corner and just lights up my world. Like, she's, she's there. She, here she is. And, and all of that's in that song. I was able to write a song that was me loving her the whole time we were together. Uh, the lyrics are metaphors and, and everything that we went through. It always was a really good song to me, and it was the hardest song I ever written because of where I was at. I was able to tell this girl that I love her in a song, knowing that I was just bad off. Now that it's going to be on this album, and to hear professional musicians once it's laid down and and once everything's polished, Calvin Sheffield Sheffield was to my right. We're at Rosewood Studios. Um. No, he's to my left, and and he he looks at me and he said, "Man, I knew you always felt the emotion. I tried to get there with you on stage, but I never could." He said, "Now I know why this song is going to be such a good song because he felt it the way I felt it when I wrote it in Rosewood Studios. That's one of their favorite cuts off the track. You know, yeah. I put it on there because of the storyline that I'm yeah. telling throughout the." The, the song, but it's one of their favorite and songs. And what's the now. song title? My Sweet Elizabeth. My Sweet Elizabeth. Yeah. And it's, what album is this on? It's it's going to be on Gypsy Soul. It's on Gypsy Soul. That's what we're going to release digitally okay. in a few weeks. Perfect. And that's my favorite song that I've that I've written. My Sweet Elizabeth. Yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna end on that. All right. Thank you so right. much for coming in. Thanks for coming to to the Lost Cody. Thanks Bar. for having me. Pleasure. And um, pleasure. I really enjoyed this. Uh, thank you guys for listening. If you want to sponsor my podcast, reach out to me. Uh, thank you for Bands Ain't Coffee, of course. Thank you to Wesley Pruitt and his awesome band. And um, look for him live in concert. And if you're not ready to come out live yet, b- buy some of his music online or buy it at the show. So thank you so much. See you later. Bye-bye.